Okay, so we had very interesting conversation la last time uh, about uh, submission to the authorities, and we uh, noticed that the Apostle Paul, although he himself would uh, get in trouble with authorities for preaching Jesus, and he would not submit, uh, still he wasn't a revolutionary, and he would say, uh, don't start a revolution. And I think the reason he would say that would be because uh, he was expecting the second coming of Jesus and he was thinking about the eternal kingdom. And uh, if any society functions, you know, there is a certain order, just, you know, pay your taxes, do not be a rebel, do not be a revolutionary. So... So Romans chapter 13, verse 5. Therefore one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this you also pay taxes, for the authorities are ministers of God, attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them. Uh, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, to respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. Any society have a certain structure, so and that structure is for the sake of order. So if it doesn't make you to go against God, just respect that society, right? So, um, and then he keeps uh, developing this thought: Oh, no one anything except to love each other, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. Well, he just reminds them the Ten Commandments, right? And of course, you know that Jesus himself says that uh, if you want to summarize all the commandments, it will be love God and love your neighbor. So, and here Paul says, well, if you love your neighbor, you won't steal, you won't steal, you won't commit a murder or adultery. So, you just behave yourself. So, right? <laughs> if you love your, if you love your neighbor, um, and then he uh, continues. Besides this, you know the time, that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep. I think this is so relevant to us as well. Uh, I hear very often that people, I mean, what does the sleep, I mean, I mean, what he's talking about when people sleep, when they don't understand what is happening around, right? Uh, not aware uh, about what is happening around. So, and he calls us to be sober. Yes, it's time for you to be sober. Um, besides, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. And this is uh, absolutely true for us as well. The night is far gone. The day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy. It's interesting that um, the work of darkness, let us cast off the works of darkness, and then he says what the work of darkness are. Orgies, drunkenness, sexual immorality, sensuality, quarreling, jealousy. These things are works of darkness. And this is Romans, but you know that we're doing our sermon series on, the, on Galatians. And there he also talks about the works of the flesh. Works of the flesh, works of darkness. Very similar, similar manifestation. And he says what we need to do instead we need to put on the armor of light. 
put on the armor of light. And he is talking about armor in Ephesians as well. Uh, and he says what that armor is. Shield of faith, breastplate of righteousness, helmet of salvation, uh, sword, which is the word of God, right? So sandals, which is our desire to share the gospel, you know. That is our armor. Uh, put on the armor of light. Armor of God, armor of light. Um, and then in 14, he again repeats the same idea. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify desires. Make no provision for the flesh. And the flesh is not just body, uh, but it's body tainted by sin. When he says the flesh, he means uh, sinful nature. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify desires. A uh, little bit er earlier, he was saying, if you go, say, to chapter 8, say, verse 12, he says uh, that we are heirs with Christ. So chapter 8, verse 12. So then, brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall, to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Abba means Daddy. Daddy, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. So here we see uh, if you live by flesh, according to the flesh, you will die. But if, you, but if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. You, know, you put to death by the Spirit. And here he, in, in, in chapter 12, he says very similar. But now he's using this imagery of darkness and light. He says that, uh, again, if we go back to chapter 13, verse 12, the night is far gone, he means darkness, darkness is far gone, the day is at hand, which means light that is coming from Jesus, it's already here. So then let us cast off the work of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime. Again, he means if you are children of light, uh, walk accordingly, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, nor in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. So uh, in the light of uh, putting on the armor of light, I would like us to read another great uh, apostle, the apostle Peter, so let us go to, if you have this uh, Bible, so it's page 1207, 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 1. Simeon, or Simon, uh, Peter, a servant, a slave of course in the Greek language, servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ, so, do you see, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours, how did you obtain a faith of equal standing with Peter's? Well, he says, by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ, not by your righteousness, <laughs> not because you can do it, but because Jesus did it for you and it's a gift, right? So, but it's exactly the same faith, right? Coming from whom? Coming from Jesus. And then this is what he wishes them. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. So we are supposed to grow in our knowledge of God. So multiply. 
And then he keeps, uh, keeps going. His divine power, which is the work of the Holy Spirit, his divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Which means it's all available. It doesn't mean that we use it. When he says, his divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, uh, it doesn't mean that we use it. It means that it's available to us. Through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. Uh, okay. How can we be godly? So through the knowledge of him, so him at a, uh, it means God, right? Who called us to his own glory and excellence. So he has called us. Uh, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, uh, precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become, through those great promises, so that through them you may become who? Who you may become? Partakers of the divine nature. What does it mean to be partaker of the divine nature? Well, it means that you become God with little g. So you become like Jesus. You become transformed by him. You are more and more like him. If we go back to uh, uh, Romans uh, chapter 12, uh, we will see what we read today. So the last verse of chapter 12 would be, he says, But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. What does it mean to put on the Lord Jesus Christ? So he will be... Uh, Several times in his epistles, he will be talking about us being like him, like Jesus. Be like Jesus. Just imitate him. Be like Jesus. Put on Jesus Christ. And then here in Peter, if we go back to Peter, he says that we can become partakers of the divine nature. Somehow God can do something in us so that we may be uh, like him, not, not, not gods with capital G, but like him, our nature may change, right? And this is what he says about our future, you know, eternal life and eternal bodies, you know. Somehow we become partakers, we participate in this divine nature. So, it's just, just amazing how the fathers, uh, church fathers, said God became man so that man can become God. But God with small g, not capital G, which means like, like a God, like. Without sin, right? And eternal. So. May become partakers of the divine nature having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. Uh, this, th th what Jesus does for us, he gives us eternal life. And, you know, Luther's famous words, where there is forgiveness of sins, there is eternal life and every blessing, right? So, which means when he forgives our sins, when he starts transforming us, when he creates this new person in us, right? This is not the end of his plan. He also wants us to give new bodies, which will live forever, right? So that is why uh, we need to become partakers of his divine nature. We need to kind of connect to him. We need to get something from him that is eternal, that doesn't see corruption. And you see, he contrasts Peter here, the corruption that is in the world because of sinful nature. And the corruption that is in the world is not just moral corruption. It's in general corruption. Leave your car for 20 years in this parking lot, what will happen to it? Corruption, right? Uh, leave, leave this, 
your house unpainted, don't paint it, don't take care of this. What you will see with this corruption. Uh, look at us. Uh, every year we get some, some sort of sickness or, you know, we, you know, our back hurts or knees or something else. That's corruption, right? So, so and, 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 and Peter says, well, because God has this amazing plan, not just to forgive our sins, but he makes us like him. And it's a mystery. We don't know exactly how that happens, but we can live eternally. So uh, this is how we escape, he says, escaped from the corruption that is in this world because of sinful desire. For this very reason, then he continues. And this is where Peter says, uh, kind of helps us to explain what Paul is talking about when he says, well, it's daylight, it's not night, you're children of day, you're not children of night. He will be talking about this in other epistles. Put on the armor of light, you know, put on Jesus, walk as you should during the day, like in light. And this is what P Peter also says very similar things. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith. Okay, you have faith. This is good. Now supplement your faith. With what? With virtue. And virtue with knowledge. And knowledge with self-control. And self-control with steadfastness. And steadfastness with godliness. And godliness with brotherly affection. Brotherly affection with love. Well, it's basically the fruit of the Spirit. Okay, so you want not just to have faith, you want your faith to manifest itself, right? In real things like loving someone or, you know, having joy or having peace. This is the manifestation. This is how you put on Jesus, right? For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, okay? You see the fruit of the Spirit, it's, again, you don't see that maybe very well in... Um, in the English language, but in the Greek language, it's karpos. It's something that maybe you feel that in the English language as well. But it starts small and then it grows. Fruit grows, matures, right? It starts like green, little green something, and then it becomes apple or, you know, plum or something. So it matures. So uh, for if these qualities, again, which come from the Holy Spirit, are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful. So you may have faith, but uh, that God exists, but it's not saving faith, it's not active faith, it's not fervent faith, right? So, and then you may become ineffective and unfruitful, right? You're just, just empty, so there is no fruit. And Luther is very angry. And very strict with this. He says, it's not saving faith, so it's not true faith, it's uh, self-deception. So you think that you have saving faith, but you don't. Just believing that God exists or Jesus died on the cross is not enough. So you need to have also, also this will component when you trust, when you cling, when you long for Jesus, when you want to embrace Jesus. You know, there is this... Uh, um, emotional component to it, right? Uh, so to speak. They keep you, for if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, for whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he's blind. Whoever lacks these qualities doesn't think, you know, how I can connect, you know, to, to the Spirit. He's near, so nearsighted that he's blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, by all more diligent, uh, be all, uh, I'm sorry, therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election, for if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way, there will be, uh, for in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Therefore, I intend always to remind you of these qualities, though you know them 
and are established in the truth that you have. Okay, you know them, you are established in the truth, but I intend always to remind you of these qualities, okay? I think it is right, as long I, as I am in this body, to stir you up by way of reminder, since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon, as our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me, and I will make every effort so that after my departure, you may be able at any time to recall these things. So that's important. So uh, what do you think how what Peter says uh, correlates with what Paul says? I mean, it's the same spirit, of course, the spirit of God speaking through both of them. The moment you leave this church, so you have to interact with people on the road, and if you go to the local store, you have to interact with people there and maybe your employer, and maybe your neighbors. Every time they do something that uh, stresses you, analyze yourself and just think, what is now happening in me? Is it my sinful nature? I mean, that I'm, I don't know, cursing or swearing or hating these people. Just, just start analyzing your emotions and reactions. I think that's the first step. And just think, okay, so that is happening in me. Uh, is, it what, is it the fruit of the Spirit? Is it coming from the Lord? Is it pleasing the Lord? Where is it coming from? Is it coming from my sinful nature or from the Spirit of God? So if I feel that I'm not angry, I forgive, you know, I want to help, and so on and so forth. Oh, that's good. I think it's pleasing the Lord. We just read uh, with you in Romans, uh, in Romans, uh, Living Sacrifice, chapter 12. I appeal to you, therefore, chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but by uh, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing, and this is what I say, when you're in mire, when you're in family fair, when you're on the word, test. By testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Test so that you may discern. So this is where it starts. I think this is the first step when you are able to analyze yourself, when you're able to discern. And the moment you see that, okay, I have this anger or I have this uh, feeling of being offended or, you know, I'm hurt, what is hurting me? Is it my pride that is hurt? Why am I hurting, right? So what, what am I feeling? When we start analyzing that and then you pray, you will see, when you pray in that moment, you will see how quickly your mood can change. Now you're hurting and then and you're angry, but you were able to uh, discern and identify that it is not from God, you, you, you detected that, and then you are asking God, well, Lord, you see this thing is attacking me, <laughs> you know, this emotion is overwhelming me, give me your peace, or heal me, or give me your comfort, and then you will see very often, this is my experience, that peace will come and that comfort will come. And very often, in my experience, it can be so overwhelmingly good. It's just like overwhelms you with this, you know, peace or, you know, and, and, and it's, uh, it's not something that you just uh, discipline yourself to do, but I think the discipline is to keep your mind, um, to, 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 re uh, to remind yourself you know, uh, what, who my enemies are, you know, or w what is happening here. So if, if, we, if we remind those things, the Lord will, uh, will provide all the help. So, but I, I think this is how you can move from just intellectually, just sitting here in a circle and reading these things and just nodding your head and saying, ah, oh, that's good stuff, that's good stuff, <laughs> to actually doing these things, right? And then you will fall, you will slip, you, you, you will fall, you will stumble. So, but then you immediately come to Lord, forgive me, I was angry here, or I was, you know, because your old Adam will be like reacting very quickly, very quickly. So, you, you would want to, you know, 
to defend yourself or to punish somebody or, you know. You call them bad habits. <clears throat> that's right, that's right. But the old Adam so will manifest himself faster probably than, you know, you would be able to. So, so which means you, you, you need to be aware of that. And you just kind of, this is why he says, kill the old Adam, crucify. So that's a process. You crucify the old Adam gradually. So you kind of, okay, so I know this is how the old Adam is attacking me. So I will crucify. I will not, as, as Paul says in chapter 12, do not make any provision. Can you help me? I close the, uh, the last, the last, the last uh, chapter. Okay. 1126. Okay, 1126. He says, uh, Chapter 13, uh, the last verse, uh, chapter four, uh, verse 14. But, so it's chapter 13, verse 14. But put on, the, uh, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. So which means how do you know, you know, desire of the flesh is to defend itself, desire is to be prideful, desire is you know, to build uh, fences, to be like a, what do you call them? No. What do you call them? Those little creatures with needles. Porcupines. Yes, like porcupine, you know. <laughs> and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires which means control your flesh, control your sinful nature. By flesh, he means sinful nature. So, control it. Takes, takes It takes practice. Yes, yes, yes. But the best practice is try to drive when it's a, a rush hour, you know, and people are, you know, getting in front of you and don't show their turn signals. Just, this is very, you know, you say, now I'm going to practice to suppress my old Adam, you know, my sinful nature, and just go in the most difficult place, and whoever does bad thing to you, you bless and pray for them. <laughs> when they're cutting you up and almost hitting you, <laughs> It's very good to be quiet and peaceful and we're sitting in the sanctuary like two meters or, uh, you know, three feet apart from each another and everybody is nice and smiling, right? But when somebody does something bad to you, so this is where you can discern, this is when you, so, this is when you can actually practice, so. But, but, but think about, is it overwhelming you to the extent that you just like, you don't see anything? It's just, you know, blinded by anger or blinded by hurt or blinded and you don't see anything. So that is not good. That is not good. So that means a sinful nature is kind of manifesting itself. And, and you saw what the, 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 the works of the flesh, it's rivalry, dissensions, you know, hatred, anger, fits of all those things, they manifest themselves. So then let us pray. Dear Jesus, uh, we are so thankful for the Apostle Paul and the Apostle Peter um, that they recorded uh, the, this truth that is coming directly from your Holy Spirit. Uh, we want to have all these virtues. We want to have saving faith. Um, we want to put on the armor of light and we want to put on you, Jesus, um, teach us. We don't know where to begin. Uh, we know it's a process. Uh, please teach us, lead us, help us to learn how to discern uh, what is good, what is perfect, what is pleasing you. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen.